Uh, Easter Sunday is a, a special time for me. I grew up in church, and so Easter was always as big, if not bigger, than Christmas, other than the gifts. Uh, so uh, just a question, how many of you are like, Easter egg, we're going to go hunt eggs after service with the kids and the grandkids, are going to go find an Easter egg hunt, or you did find an Easter egg hunt this weekend? Hands up if that's you. All right, how many of the rest of you are like, I just want some ham and a nap? Yeah, I feel you people. I'm with you. So I, I, I pray that you have some time today, that you take some time today to just remember what he did. That, that I know we can, we can, I mean, we can commercialize everything. We do an amazing job at that. We can, we can sometimes forget the reason why, but the, the reality is with, without, without the cross and the empty tomb, we have nothing. We have nothing. And so take a moment today. Take a moment today to remember that all that you were is forgiven and forgotten because of all that he is. And, and I'm so thankful for that today. I pray today. I want to I wanna challenge you today. And we're going to be in John chapter 20. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to talk about the resurrection, but we're not going to talk about the morning of. We're going to talk about the night of. The resurrection. And, and as I was walking through this passage, I really began to get burdened by it in my own life because I saw myself in the passage. I don't know if you ever read the Bible that way, where you're, you're looking through the Bible, you're reading a scripture or something, and all of a sudden it's as if God puts your name in there. Or God just puts your name in there because there are times that I do that and, and man, it, He just stops me in my tracks. And, and I'm so thankful for those moments because even though I've been doing this for 20 years, there's still moments that I need God to get kind of right in my plate, right in my, I was going to say right in my lap, but some of you are experiencing that right now. Um, but I, I want God to do that. I want him to still show up in my life in a way that causes me to stop and to really assess where my heart is, where my mind is. And this passage did that for me this last, it's been a couple of weeks back that I saw it for the first time. And I uh, didn't see the passage, but it really opened up to me for the first time. So we're going to dive into it. I'm going to read through the passage, and then we're going to come back and just walk through it. It's going to be kind of expositional today. And then we're just going to take the verses and tear them apart some. Uh, but reading it, starting in verse 19 of chapter 20, it says, On the evening of that day. How many of you remember your that day? That day you said yes to Jesus. That day that, that everything changed for you. Some of you can remember that day. Was it, how many of you got saved in a church service? Hands up. How many of you got saved in not a church service? And we have a lot of unsaved people here this morning because those are the only two options. <laughs> Y'all just wait for the altar call, boys. It's going to be a good one. So... No, I, I was saved in my living room. I, I grew up in church. I grew up knowing all the stories. I actually grew up teaching Sunday school. I started teaching Sunday school when I was about 12 years old because we'd have a teacher not show up. And being the preacher's kid, my dad would say, you can read, put me in the classroom. And so I was teaching kids at, at 12 and then I kept going and started teaching in the adult class by about the age of 15. And, and I say all this to say this, I did all of that with knowing about Jesus, but not knowing Jesus. It wasn't until an evening where I got convicted by my wife about really knowing him. Do you know him? Well, yeah, I know him. I know this verse. I know this verse. And I could quote scripture. And the question just kept coming back. Do you know him, though? And I didn't. And I knelt at a coffee table in my living room at a duplex on Newton Avenue here in Mountain Home. I knelt at that coffee table. And I kept that coffee table for a long time because it was so much more than a coffee table to me. It was my altar. This is where I broke and laid it all down before Christ. And, and so I, I, I remember that day. And I love the wording that John uses here when he says that on the evening of that day, the resurrection day, the first day of the week, this is, this is just a couple hours after the ladies had got to the tomb and realized that he was not there. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, is what the angel told the ladies. And they ran back and told the stubborn men, I didn't get an amen on that at all. Like, <laughs> nothing, ladies. I'm trying to help you out here. They went back and told the men, and the men ran to the tomb. Same thing. They found nothing there. Why do you seek this living among the... He's not... He told you he wasn't going to be here. Over in the book of Luke, we get a priest's story to what I'm going to read to you here in just a moment. 
where these two gentlemen are walking on their way to Emmaus. And on their way to Emmaus, which is about seven miles outside of Jerusalem, as they get on this road to Emmaus, a stranger begins walking with them and asks them, said, hey, what are you guys talking about? The Scripture tells us in Luke that immediately their faces were downcast. They immediately went to the negative. Our friend was killed. And now now his body is gone. Well, that stranger was Jesus that was walking with them. They just didn't realize it yet. It's a long day. Lots of stuff happened on that day, that resurrection day in history, just inside and outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Some pretty amazing things. They're trying to deal with the the chaos in the temple where the veil had been torn and and the earth had shook and they're dealing with all kinds of stuff on this Sunday morning in Jerusalem. But yet, I want to move us further into the day. And on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I want to walk back through that passage with you before I get to the last verse. Jesus comes back again and repeats himself. He says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. It's the last verse in the context of this, verse 21. And we see this passage where Jesus kind of closes off with that. He, he then follows up and says, There's, this Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you will be able to go and forgive sins and it's going to be amazing. He's given this mandate to the disciples. But before he gets to that part, this section of Scripture, ha- scripture happens. And the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the disciples had found themselves locked in a room for fear of the Jews. And today I want to just kind of walk into some of this passage and I want to ask you maybe one question and then we're going to kind of follow through with what Jesus did with that question and the question I want to ask you is what rooms have you locked yourselves in what rooms in your heart what rooms in your mind have you locked yourselves in even though how many of you would say and I want you to be loud and rowdy on this if you can how many of you know Jesus saves say amen Amen. how many of you know Jesus heals say amen. amen how many of you know that he has the best thought out for you in this world And yet, we lock ourselves in rooms of fear. That's what the disciples did. Think about that. These guys had walked with Jesus at least three and a half years. Some of them been there with the beginning. Some of them there were on the beach when he called them. Hey, if you come with me, I'll make you fishers of men. You won't be fishing out of the boat anymore. You're going to be fishing up here with me. Let's go find some people. Peter and James and John and the rest of the crew. They're walking with Jesus three and a half years. They'd watched him walk on water. They had watched him heal the blind, make the lame to walk, give those that couldn't speak the ability to speak. They literally watched him raise the dead. And although he told them this all was going to happen, they locked themselves in a room for fear. I used to get really frustrated with the disciples because I would read about them and go, bunch of idiots. I don't, I'm not being blasphemous. I'm just, how many of you know sometimes you'll read a story and then because you're on the different side of the story. Like I was quoting scripture as I was studying this. I was quoting scriptures to the disciples and I'm like, you guys, if you'd have just believe that Jesus owned the cattle on a thousand hills and he's able to supply and he's everything you will ever need. And all this, I'm ripping scripture off to him and God hit me broadside in the side of the head and said, Vince, that hadn't been written yet. They didn't, they didn't have that to look back on like you have it to look back on. These are people that are dealing with legitimate fear and confusion. I thought he was going to be with us. I thought he was going to. So actually, I, I literally have less excuse than the disciples do. Because I, I have all the rest. I have all of what Paul wrote about Jesus. I have all of what John came back and wrote in, in Revelation and in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Because that's what I was doing. I'm like, man, if the disciples just repent right here, the Lord would be faithful and cleanse them of all unrighteousness. That was written in 1st John way after this moment where they were afraid. What I'm finding out is that situations and moments will put us in a place of fear. They don't have to be your moment. Some people, some of you right now, you've got a room locked in your heart and in your mind that's where your abuse stays. 
You, you got a room right now in your heart and in your mind, and that's where, that's where your bitterness stays. And, and you can kind of put it in there, but it's locked up and no one's getting in, and you ain't coming out because that's a comfortable place for you to go hang out. That's where you keep your unforgiveness. You know, those people that have wronged you in the past, you keep a box with their names on it so you can kind of go in that room and file through the names and stay mad. And you stay there for fear because, I mean, what, what might happen if you actually forgave them? What might happen if you got healing for the abuse rather than help from the abuse? You say, Vince, you don't understand. I would never assume that I do. And please don't hear what I'm saying as an assumption that I understand what you've walked through. What I understand is that we all lock ourselves into some rooms from time to time. Whether they be fear, whether they be insecurity, whether they be anxiety, whether it be doubt, whatever it is, we find ourselves locked in this room where no one can get in. The disciples had locked the door in fear of the Jews. If they went after Jesus, they're coming after us. I mean, they hung him on a cross. What are they going to do to us? We, we've got to make, we got to get away. We got to hide. Jesus said, hey, just so you guys know, they're going to kill me and I'm going to get up three days later. Yeah, now we know that, but we're going to hide because we're not quite sure we can believe it. The reason you and I lock ourselves in rooms continually is because we're still not quite sure we can believe every promise Jesus has given us. Now, I'm not saying they're not true. The promises are true. I said we are not quite sure we can believe it. Because we throw ourselves in the mix. Why would Jesus ever do that for me? Why would Jesus heal me from the abuse? Why would Jesus heal me from the anger? Why would Jesus heal me from... Why would He do that? Well, it's, it's not enough just to say He wants to. That's what we see in the next part of the passage. We see in the next part of the passage where... I love this because it says that Jesus appeared. Jesus came and stood with them in the room... And said, peace be unto you. Oh, I hear some of you. You just had a moment with Jesus, didn't you? Yes, uh, G- peace. I'm going to tell you straight up. Jesus didn't say peace because that was the Jesus thing to say. I just, I, maybe I read the Bible differently than you. But some people read the Bible where they got this Jesus picture. How many of you have a Jesus picture? You liars. Put your hands up if you have a Jesus picture. <laughs> Don't you leave me hanging up here all by myself in this hot, crowded room. We have a Jesus picture in our mind, and sadly, most of the time, we have this Jesus picture where he floats across the floor in a white robe and a purple sash and amazing hair. (laughs) And he went with the middle part. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, so some of you don't get that. That's okay. But he went, that's the picture we have, and we feel like every time that Jesus shows up, he speaks in this really calm, baritone voice. It's like, peace be still. And you're like, whew, that's good. Jesus showed up and said something. No, 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 listen, I'm telling you, you read the scripture. The door was locked and Jesus appeared with them. I don't know if he came through the floor, through the ceiling, walked through the wall, or just was, and he was there. But I'm going to tell you, the reason Jesus said, peace be still, would be the same reason if I showed up and was able to do that, I would have to go, stop freaking out. (laughs) Peace be still was a, hey, 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 it's really me. Calm down, come on, calm down. Y'all ever been scared before? I believe people that scare people intentionally have a special place. In... <laughs> I'm not going to say. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, when Jesus showed up in that room, he didn't show up and whisper, peace be still. He showed up and was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Peter, get out of John's lap. It's okay. It's really me. Peace, buddy, peace. Chill, chill. And, and I know this because I have a four-year-old and Brinley is four and Brinley is learning some stuff at daycare and what she is learning is that in times of intense moments, you need to calm down. Calm down, she'll say. Calm down. Some, it's really cute until she says it to me. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate, you all know it. Listen, parent, you, parents in the house, put your hands up. If your child says, hey, 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 dad, Mom, chill. chill out. <laughs> How many of you know and understand that child is about that close from meeting Jesus on a whole new level? <laughs> oh, but Bryn's for so she doesn't get it. We took a vacation and, and God blessed our wisdom and we rented a minivan for a maxi family. 
And so, like, we have a big family. So we had every seat in the minivan full, and we decided, hey, let's drive to the middle of Florida. That should be fun for 16 hours. And so we did. We had a great time, but you could tell it started getting intense, and I started being the dad in the moment. I'm like, we're in a we're in a beat. You don't have to talk that loud. You're literally right next to him. Stop talking. You know, I, I don't, but I can't hear because everybody else is talking. Everybody else, be quiet. And I'm getting to that moment. Parents, you understand, right? And Brindley, calm down. <laughs> it's so funny because she'll put her hands up. She'll be like, chill out, chill out. Chill. I'm about to break your hands off. Your... Yeah. <laughs> I would never do that. But how many of you understand what I'm saying? Okay, thank you for not leaving me alone on that. Sometimes it's the word. Sometimes Jesus showed up and said, come, fellas, come, come, whoa, 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 calm down, calm down. Peace. Sometimes we need to be calm. Sometimes we need that to happen in our life. Sometimes in the midst of our room where there's anxiety and there's pain and there's stress and there's agony and there's anger and there's bitterness and there's hurt and there's trauma. And we start that spiral with it. We need God to just show up and go, whoa, 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 whoa. Just calm down. Peace. Peace be to you. <laughs> God bless you, whoever kid that was. You're going you're gonna to have to deal with it from now until Jesus comes back. <laughs> Every time she's going to be like, I had Pastor Bench. <laughs> but I love that Jesus doesn't stop at peace. How many of you know sometimes it's really good to hear an encouraging word? How many of you know sometimes you want to hear anything but a word? Let's be, just, can, I'm just going to be straight with you for a little while, church, if that's okay with you, is that sometimes a word's not enough. And, and we as Christians, we're the worst at it. We, we are the worst at it. We will throw stuff out in passing that we don't mean because it's the Jesus thing to say or the Christian thing to say. Man, I'm really struggling right now. I'll, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. And we keep on moving in our life and may or may not ever pray for them. Man, I'm really struggling right now in my marriage or with my relationships or, or with my job. Well, I'll just, you know what? I, Jesus knows right where you're at. Can I, can I be transparent with you and say there have been days where I'm like, really? Because I don't feel he's, he's right where I'm at right now. I know I'm, I'm supposed to be the one that tells you different. That No, that's what, now listen, I, I believe in him. And, and I follow him and I love him. And never has he failed me. But in my heart and in my own mind, there are moments when a word just isn't enough. When, when, when it's encouraging. I see this people, people all the time. They'll be walking through tr something traumatic. And the phrase gets used, hey, you just let me know if I can do anything. And the reason we use that phrase is because we don't know what to do, which is fair. But here's just a set, just, I'm going to give you a set you free on some of this. If you feel the urge to tell somebody, if there's anything I can do, just let me know. Don't ask or don't say that. Just do it. Just do it. Well, what if, what, what if I don't do the right thing? I promise the person on the other side won't care. They'll just be thankful somebody did something instead of just offered a word. I love that Jesus understands the disciples' fear here. I love that that's what he recognizes first, is their fear. He wasn't trying to prove himself to anybody. He wasn't trying to show up and show off. He just said, hey, you're afraid, and I'm here. Peace. Peace. But then he followed up. He followed up, because sometimes, like I said, words aren't enough. Sometimes, like somebody was asking, people keep asking me, like, hey, Pastor Vince, how's that grandbaby? I don't know how to answer that, because she's amazing. But even that's not enough. I think she's going to look like her grandpa. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I mean, until she turns like 15, then the bald head and the big nose is going to throw her. But yeah, no, she's awesome. But I can't, I can't, I can't tell you how she is because I don't even have the words for it. Sometimes words aren't enough on both the positive side and the negative side. And Jesus understands that when, when He walks and when He appears in this room and the disciples are freaking out and He says, Peace be to you. Peace unto you. It's okay. I'm here now. But I just need you to know I'm not going to give you a rah-rah speech. I need to show you. Then He showed them His hands and His side. 
That's what the passage says at the end of verse 20. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. I love that Jesus shows the completed work. He doesn't show them the wounds, the blood. He doesn't show them the open sore. He shows them a scar. He shows them it's healed. It's over. It's been won. The victory is ours. We're good. I need you to trust me now. Because everything I told you has come to pass. Everything that I walked you through has come to pass. Some of you right now, you stay in this room and you believe Jesus for all these things. You just don't believe he can actually do all these things. You say, no, 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 that's not it, Pastor Vince. Maybe you're like I am. Maybe you believe Jesus can do all those things. You just don't believe he'll do them for you. And Jesus is saying, let me show you that I'm willing to do it for you. So what he's showing the disciples. Let me, let me show you that I'm willing to do this for you, that I'm willing to walk through this for you, that everything I said is true, that every victory that I promised is real. And I'm not showing you an open wound because if I showed you an open wound, you would say, well, he's just getting there. No, Jesus said, I'm showing you the healed spot. All that's left is a scar. And all a scar tells you is that I was in a battle and I won. Because see, death can't show the scar because death lost. The hell and the grave, they can't win. They can't show you anything that shows victory because they didn't have any that day. And so I wonder in your life right now, if you've been sitting there and Jesus has tried to appear in your room and you've argued with him when he gets there. No, this is just my cross to bear. This is my personality. This is just who I am. This is stuff I've got to hang on to. And I want to tell you that, that there is something that needs to shift. And we see it in the disciples' life. We see it happen almost between one verse and the next verse. A radical shift happens. They go from being locked in a room with fear to glad in their heart. And the reason it happens is because they waited on then. It's not great grammar. Waiting on then. Grammar is not my specialty, so I don't feel bad about that. So... I've had lots of then moments in my life. Where, where I, like I, I, I dated around trying to figure out what God wanted to do in my life. I, I would go on dates, but I didn't really have a girlfriend or anything like that. But then, then, then I looked across the floor at the Missing Horse Dance Arena <laughs> and saw my wife. She wasn't my wife then. She was going to be. Then... We, we got married and we got pregnant and she was pregnant for nine months with Vanessa and during that pregnancy there was some, there was some weird cravings. She wanted these dole fruit popsicles. At the time we lived in Yellville and I don't know if you know that Yellville closes, like the whole town closes. <laughs> Back then it did and, and, and we, we lived there and it was so hard to find dole fruit popsicles at 11.30 at night when the craving would hit her and you couldn't buy them in the store. You could only buy them in the convenience store's freezer section and I was freaking out. And we went through that for a while and then finally then Vanessa was born. And then we did it again with Kaylee and all this pregnancy stuff. And then on February 21st, Vanessa was, or Kaylee was born. And then with Brayden on March 21st, he was born. And then on January 3rd, Parker was born. And then on May 29th, Caleb was born. All that stuff came to a place where then it made all of it worth it. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. Some of you had other thens in your life. Some of you were racked with addiction and the devil was owning you. He ran your life, made your decisions, did everything for you, and you were addicted. And then Jesus Christ showed up and changed it all. Some of you were sitting in a marriage situation where it was in pieces and you didn't know if it was going to be able to be put back together. And you weren't sure if you really liked the other person, much less loved the other person. And Pastor Vince, you just don't know the kind of stuff they've done to me and how they've hurt me. And then the power of God showed up in that marriage and radically changed it and saved it into something that it is now. A witness for people to look at. What happened? God showed up and gave you a then moment. 
The same thing happened in the disciples' life where here they are, racked with fear. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. This Jesus has died and He's left us here. Then He showed up. Then they were glad in their hearts. Why? Because Jesus showed up. I wonder in your life right now, I wonder if for you there have been moments, and maybe you're still there, and you're just shy of your then moment. I think a lot of times in the local church, what we see is a lot of people really enjoy church, and they get up to the moment where then God wants to do something radical in their life, and they go, wait, that's big. That's big. God, I, I think I want to follow you, and I love church, and I love the music, and I love Pastor Vince makes me laugh when we preach on Sunday. I love that stuff, but, but this whole commitment, then God showed up, and you gave your life to him. Then Jesus showed up, and you surrendered all. What would happen on the other side of that? See, the disciples didn't know what was going to happen. They just knew they were glad that Jesus was there. I wonder in your life, if you can understand that if you'll submit to the then moment, that God will take what's on the other side of your life and do something radical with it. He will do something that will be life-changing, life-altering. When we started Real Life Church, I, I was struggling. God, man, I, I don't know how to do this. I'm messing up. I can't do it. God said, I, I need you to move. I need, I need you to trust me. I need you to move. I'm like, God, I, I, okay, what do you want me to do? And I quit my job to focus on the church. And the church paid me $200 a week. It's a family of seven. $200. Now, listen, before you think that I'm, I'm, I would never ask anybody to do that. My story is my story. But that's what God asked me to step into. And I said, Lord, I promised you I'd trust you in this, so I'm going to trust you in this. And then God showed up. And for the last 10 years in Mountain Home, the last 12 years of Real Life Church as a whole, I've only seen God move in radical ways. People said, people don't want to come back to church anymore. That's what the virus did, is they made people so comfortable not being in church that they don't want to come back to church. And then, God showed up. And then, it was Easter Sunday and we had an excuse to come back. And then some things happen. I wonder in your life, what is, what is keeping you from stepping into the and then moment? What is stopping you from believing God like you believe? And you know what? He, you all just said it a minute ago. You know He can save. You know He can heal. You know He can deliver. You know He can provide. You know He is that God. Then why aren't we trusting Him to step out of that broken, locked room? good news is that he can show up in the room. Just like he did with the disciples. Just like he did in other times in your life. Just like he did for me at that living room coffee table. Just like he did for some folks on Friday night here at the church. Just like he did for folks in the 830 service. Just like he can do for you. He's waiting on then. Then God showed up. Then their hearts were glad. Why? Because Jesus is here. And Jesus makes it all work. This is not me telling you some fluff story to make you feel better about where you've been. No, where you've been is broken and He wants to heal it. He doesn't want to just help you get through today. He wants to heal you from your yesterday. And so many of you, so many of us, myself included, I still wrestle with this. I still try to handle it on my own. I still get locked in that room, not realizing that I'm by myself. Until God appears in the room and He says, I've been standing outside the door knocking, Vince, but I can't wait anymore. I, I, I'm here for you. I've got you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to worry. You don't have to doubt. I'm right here. Let's walk out the door together. I guarantee you, you can see the shift in the disciples' hearts after Jesus showed up. Later on, we see a verse that says, And these men, these fearful men that were hiding in this room, these men turned the entire world upside down with the cause of Jesus Christ. What happened? Jesus showed up. What's stopping you? What's keeping you from, from saying, God... 
Whatever you need me to do. Whatever you need me to do. Well, Vince, what if that whatever is more than I think I can do? Let me just set you free. It will be. It will be. How would we ever brag on so big of God if he only asked us to do small things? No. He wants to change the world through you. He wants, to step in, he wants you to step into a faith like you've never known and see something amazing. See that this empty tomb, see that this hands inside that have been healed, see that those things are very real. He wants you to see them and then be filled with gladness because you trusted him. Not just because you've seen him, but you trusted that he's true. Not just because he said peace to you, but you believe that peace can be yours. That's what he wants for you. I want you to bow with me, church, if you would. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Vince, I don't know peace like that. I don't, nobody's ever showed up for me. Jesus showed up for you. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He showed up for you. My God, my God, why have you turned your back on me? Because you have the sin of the world on you, Jesus, and I can't look at you. Father, it is finished. The victory has been won. The sins have been forgiven. So what now? Now you say yes. What if today was your then moment? You know, I was going to church for a long time, or I'd been out for a while, or I just really didn't know how to get back in, or when to start, or you know what? I've been running from Jesus for a long time, and then one Easter day, I stepped back into the church, and the pastor told me I could have a then Jesus came moment, and then my heart would be glad, and then I would go live a life pleasing unto the Lord. That's the day that it happened for me. What if today is your day? You can't get there by yourself. You're going to need some help. It's one of the reasons I love that song that we sang just as we were going into the worship set, that second song. Not for a minute was I forsaken. Not for a minute did you leave me, Jesus. You know what? I'm not enough on my own. I'm not enough by myself. I'm not enough if I try to do this. But Jesus, you're going to show up in the room because that's the God that you are. You're going to show up in the room because that's the Savior that you are. And I'm going to trust that when you show up in the room, I'm going to follow you because then I'm living the life God has called me to live.